See if you can find your sermon outline. It's on buff-colored paper and has this passage in very bold italics at the top. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, It is a fact of life. Are you ready for this? When your outgo exceeds your income, then your upkeep will be your downfall. Okay, I'll try it again. When your outgo exceeds your income, then your upkeep will be your downfall. And that is true whether you're a country, look at the mess the United States is in right now, whether you're a business, whether you're a church, whether you're a family, whether you're an individual, and it doesn't just apply to money. It also applies to our energy, our time, our enthusiasm. You know, the the, the more we go, 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 give, 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 the, the more we need to keep up. Think about it for a moment. Uh, the, the more you have, the more you have to worry about, the more you have to maintain, the more you have to ensure, the more you have to protect, the more you have to consider. What we're talking about today is boiling that down to godly contentment. Let's read this passage together. God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. What I'd like you to do is take your pencil and circle the word needs. Let's talk about that particular word for just a moment. What's the difference between a need and a greed? Right? Because there's lots of things that we want, and I call those greeds. You know, we're, we want the $10 instead of the $2. Right? We want the, the nicer stuff, the bigger stuff, the more expensive. And God promises to supply our needs. This little girl up here said it beautifully. Food, water, clothes. Not even house. Interesting. Second word to circle is the word will. That's a promise from God that he will do it, but will is a future tense word, isn't it? I'm impatient. I'll admit it. I wish that God would have supplied my needs yesterday so I don't even have to think about them today. But in the Lord's Prayer, we pray, give us this day our daily bread. And will means that at the time we need it, that's when he'll give it to us. Maybe not a moment sooner. Next, please circle the word all. Oh, I love that word because our God is a God of abundance. The feeding of the 5,000, 12 basketfuls left. The body and blood of Christ will receive in the sacrament here at peace and how many services we have and all the other services and all the other sacramental churches in the whole country, more than enough. He will supply all your needs. And now I'd like to ask you to underline the last half of that uh, that sentence. This is very important. It says, according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. He doesn't supply our needs based on our assets, based on our neighbor's assets, based on our country's assets, but based on God's assets, God's riches. And you're all familiar probably with this acronym. If not, you might want to write it down. Grace, the grace of God, God's riches, His assets at Christ's expense. And that defines that His assets are the spiritual things of forgiveness of sin the gift of heaven, the promise of eternity, life everlasting. All of that is ours in faith. God supplies all our needs, especially our needs of faith. And in reality, we know that contentment is both spiritual and physical. And the two go together, and that makes godly contentment. We'll talk about that as we move forward. I just want to give you five Uh, five whens. When this is happening in our life, we will find contentment. The first one is that we we need to ask God. Okay? Read that first passage with me on your sheet, the one in bold. You do not have because you do not ask God. I'm kind of guilty of that. I'll be honest with you. That's part of why sometimes I'm preaching to myself more than I'm preaching to you, and I need to hear it. Because sometimes I don't think about asking God about the little things. I don't want to bother Him. I'm a busy person. I can't imagine how busy God is, right? And yet, He invites us to ask Him for even the little things. So we need to remember to keep our prayers uh, asking God for those needs. Next one is to 
have or learn contentment. Contentment. Uh, and, and what is contentment? Contentment is not not having goals, you know, and just kind of going through life not, am, not ambitious or anything like that. that that's not contentment. Contentment means that my happiness doesn't depend on circumstances. And that would be a good word to write in there. My happiness, my wellness, my wholeness does not depend on circumstances. Take a look at that uh, uh, passage from Paul. That first one right under, under learned contentment. I know how to live, underline, not on nothing or with everything. Think about that. What Paul is saying is, I could have be a pauper and have almost nothing, just enough to live on. I can be content. Or I can have billions of dollars and be the richest person in the world, and I can be content. It doesn't matter. Contentment isn't based on circumstances. Next one. Practice generosity. We have a wonderfully generous God, as we've been talking about. And uh, his generosity is overwhelming at times. And I have found that people who are striving for contentment, that's often missing in their lives. They're not giving much. They just continue to take and take and take. They get stuck in the when-then syndrome. Are you ready for this? Okay. When I get out of school, then I'll be content. How's that working out for you? <laughs> when I get married, then I'll be content. My wife's here and she knows that's true. But not for everybody. When I get divorced, then I'll be content. When the kids leave home, then I'll be, you know, you can go on and on. And, and you never get there, right? You just keep wanting more and more. It's not about what we get and when we get it, but what we give. Rich people are often, I'm talking wealthy people, are often unhappy until they learn that. John Rockefeller, John D. Rockefeller said, I have made many, many, many millions, but they brought me no happiness. John Vanderbilt, the railroad tycoon, the care of $200 million is a burden too great for any brain or back to bear. It's enough to kill anyone. There is no pleasure in it. I know what some of you are thinking. I'd like to give it a try <laughs> to, to have that kind of money, but it doesn't bring happiness. Uh, Andrew Carnegie, millionaires seldom smile, he said. Millionaires seldom smile. Now, each of these families, in their own way, even with all that wealth, began to give. Give back to the communities. Give back to people. Give back to good causes and charities, and that's where their happiness is. True happiness finally came. It's the same with us. God has given us so much, and he says, to be truly happy and truly blessed, give back. And he happens to say 10%. That's why we teach the tithe. And I was thinking about that this week. Why did God say 10%? And I have no idea. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say. He could have said 50%. Boy, that would make us squirm, isn't it? If the church was teaching to give 50% of all your income, he could have said that. But he chose 10. It's very manageable, and we can do that. And then we can do more than that. And I've known people that when they do more, whether it's their money, their time, their abilities, their life, more than that to the Lord, that's when their happiness really grows. Next one. Maintain integrity. This one speaks for itself. I'd like to ask you to read those two verses with me on your sheet. Here we go. The Lord demands fairness in every business deal. And the next one, better be poor and honest than rich and dishonest. Boy, that's the wonderful truth from God's Word. Integrity is very important to Him. And finally, trust Him with your life. And you might put in there with your whole life, your entire life. Um, when we trust Him with our whole life, the worry stops. Now, I'll put my hand up with you. How many of you are worriers? Not everybody. I'd say about a third of us, okay. And, you know, 
I, I read something that really struck me the other day that worry, extreme worry, is one step away from atheism. Because when we worry, we're not trusting God. And when we don't trust God, what kind of God is He? And that really struck me in my concept of worry and how when we trust our whole lives to Him, that's when contentment can really come. What I'd like to do with you now is, is just do a brief little study of contentment. And this comes from a very personal part of our lives. Uh, a lot of you know that we went to Texas over the last 10 days and, and painted a house. Well, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about that because it truly is a study in contentment. The house is located near Cisco, Texas, and it's down that little lane. And at the end of that lane are some buildings and a house, and that's the cattle, cattle guard, cattle crossing there. And it belonged to Karen's grandfather, Theodore Rich. Her great-grandfather, Adolf Rich, came over from Germany with a wife and a child on the boat. The child, his firstborn son, Adolf, nearly died on the journey. Her great-grandmother was told to please take that baby down below to shut him up because he was crying all the time. And she absolutely refused to do that because she knew that on those passages across the ocean, a baby taken below would not come back up alive. And Adolf survived the germ journey. A stubborn German woman, my wife's great-grandmother. Connect the dots. <laughs> and I love her for it. Adolf and his wife and son lived in a cave to start with near Cisco because there was no house for them. A cave. Built fires, cooked, lived off the land. Eventually he got a job with the railroad. Walked four miles to town, worked all day sometimes days on end, and would walk back. They ended up with 13 children, eight of whom were boys. As the boys grew, he was able to buy land and create a farm, and he would go to work on the railroad every day while the boys stayed and made a living off of that land, to the point where he was able to purchase 160 acres of land for each one of his sons and set them up in a place where they could make their own living. Her grandfather, Theodore Rich, down this lane, that was his 160 acres. And he lived, he and his wife, Lily, lived in this kind of beautiful setting, live oak trees. He planted them nearly 100 years ago, and they've grown to the point where they look now. And they lived, it's a harsh climate. There's uh, prickly pear cactus. Sometimes that might have been all they had to eat because a little ball grows on the end of those, and you can peel it open, and it's got some nice nice fruit in it. And the buildings are still there, though they're somewhat dilapidated now, but each of them he built with his own hands and dammed up a pond so that there would be a stock tank. And they literally lived off of the land, never really had a job in town, but would raise chickens and sell the eggs to the grocery store and to others. And I think they went to town twice a week, once to do laundry. They didn't have a washer, dryer, dishwasher. Uh, didn't have central air or heat or anything like that, just kind of lived in this little house down the lane in Cisco, Texas, doing what they could. Now, Karen spent her summers there, weeks at a time, and she has nothing but positive memories of her grandmother and grandfather, the most godly, contented people that she had ever met and that I had ever met. Not two nickels to rub together. This is how poor they were. There was a big hill that came down to where that lane is. And when they'd be on the top of the hill, Grandpa would make fun because their car didn't have power steering, so it didn't matter. He'd just shut the car off and coast all the way down the hill and see if he could possibly get it in the driveway without having to start it again because he didn't want to waste the gas. Yeah, living a very simple, humble life. But when you talk to Karen about it, she will tell you, that when Grandma would bring the food out to eat, his comment would always be to look at that food and say, we are so rich. Now, folks, grab a hold of that. Because his richness wasn't some food they scratched out of the earth. But every morning they would open the Bible and Grandpa could barely read, maybe sixth grade education, but he would work his way through reading out loud the Word of God. Grandma would have hers, the kids would have theirs. And they would pray. 
And Karen said when she was a little girl, those prayers went on forever and ever. He thanked God for every animal, for every relative, for everything. And, and he meant it. He was content because he had Jesus. I came into the family about the time that uh, they were on their way to Karen's little brother Charles, 10 years younger, his uh, confirmation in the neighboring town. And there was a bad accident. And Grandma was killed in that accident, and Grandpa was injured badly. He couldn't stay at the farm anymore. The family remembers the funeral there in the little church in Cisco, Texas. Grandpa, he called her his good helper, and he waved as he said goodbye. His life was dramatically and traumatically changed. He was uprooted from this place where he had spent his whole adult life, raised his family, half raised his grandkids, his good helper of all those years ripped away from his life. And that's when I met him. I had the privilege of getting to know him over about a 10, 15 year period, preaching at his funeral at that same little church in Cisco, Texas, and even in those horrible circumstances, I could say of him, he was the most kind, gentle, godly, contented man that I had ever met. What was it? It wasn't the place. It wasn't even his good helper. It wasn't his family. It was Jesus. Now, I don't know what your circumstances are, where you've been or where you're going, but I want you to be able to say every day, we are so rich. We are because we have Jesus. Nothing can change that. In our series, we've had a joy, a challenge, and a temptation, and for this, they're all the same. Think about it for a minute. Our greatest joy is that spiritual and physical contentment. Our greatest challenge is to have that contentment, but to keep growing. Like Grandma and Grandpa did, reading their Bible every day, growing in the Lord, not being content to just stop, but to continue growing closer to Him every day. And the temptation is contentment with apathy, not caring about God, not caring about faith, being content with the things. That's a big danger because then our spiritual lives are lost. Let's read the passage together one more time. God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Please pray with me. Lord, we are so rich. We have more than we need. Spiritually, you're about to fill us up again with the forgiveness of sins through the body and blood of Christ. Physically, none of us are hungry. None of us are lacking. We could feed many more people with our refrigerators, freezers, and pantries contents. Thank you, Lord. May we truly look at our life again and anew today and realize that in Christ Jesus, we are so rich. In his precious name, amen.